All right, hello everybody. Um, all right, I'm just looking at the time there. Uh, last time I did this uh, this video, uh, it went horribly awry. So I'm going to try it again, and I might be a little bit cautious this time. But um, it also lasted very long, and I didn't want to do that to you, uh, you know, this time around. So, uh, but what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the uh, creating a brand new government. We have the American Revolution. We have the Declaration of Independence we already talked about, and as of July 2nd, uh, 1776, uh, the, uh, the American colonies are no longer considering themselves to be British colonies. They consider themselves to be their own country, and uh-oh, now we have to figure out a way to govern this country. And that was a, a real challenge, I mean, if you really consider it, because historically these countries have largely been... Um, have been, uh, you know, governed by traditional means, but now we have to have a country that is going to have to build and shape its own government. Fortunately, the American colonists had a little bit of experience with this. But what we're going to talk about today is the first attempt at governing a new, uh, this new nation. And as you're going to see, didn't necessarily go so well. So let's take a look here. Um, the essential question, or the essential, um, the, the focus of this particular uh, exercise is going to be to analyze the accomplishments and the shortcomings of the Articles of Confederation, our very first, um, you know, embodiment of a national government. Oh, well, this is going to uh, uh, deal with Key Concept uh, 3.2 in your AP Guide for those of you who are interested. So what are these elusive Articles of Confederation? Well, as I said you know, before, uh, the Articles of Confederation, or the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union between the states, was the, uh, this brand new body of, uh, of uh, structure that we're going to give to a brand new government. It's really, really important to understand the, uh, the historical context here. Because uh, oftentimes how we study this is we study the American Revolution and then we study the Articles of Confederation and we kind of get the picture that the Articles of Confederation uh, came after the American Revolution. That's just not true. The Articles of Confederation came during the American Revolution. The Founding Fathers were creating this government while they were fighting the American Revolution. Pretty amazing uh, feat when you really stop and think about it. Um, but the, uh, the Articles of Confederation are going to be uh, drafted shortly after the, uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence, and um, ultimately they're not going to be completely ratified until uh, 1781, but for the most part, the, uh, the, the Continental Congress at this stage of the game is going to largely follow their, uh, the ideas of the Articles of Confederation. So, uh, so this was going on concurrently with the American Revolution, and... It's going to be shaped by uh, the reasons for entering into the, uh, into the American Revolution. Remember, the, um, the Founding Fathers entered into this war uh, because they wanted to uh, get away from uh, you know, oppressive taxes, but they were also concerned about British tyranny and the fact that the British crown was asserting too much power and too much control over the American colonists, what they perceived to be tyranny, uh, and even referred to as slavery. Um, so, consequently, they didn't want to create a government that would also be tyrannical and uh, enslaving. They wanted to create a limited government. Um, and, as we'll see by the end of the lecture, maybe they went a bit too far in this. Now, uh, how are these governments, uh, how are these colonies going to be governed? Well, the, um, according to the Articles of Confederation, each colony was going to, have a, was going to be represented in a, uh, a Congress, uh, and each colony, all these 13 colonies, would have exactly one vote. It didn't matter how big your colony was, got one vote, baby, that was it, game over. Um, so your Virginia, you got a huge population, a lot of territory, one vote. Rhode Island, eh, not so much of a population, itty bitty territory, one vote. Everybody gets one vote, call it cool. This, eh, this is going to be a bit of a problem as well. Um, the people who served in the, uh, in the legislature, in the Congress, were elected to annual terms. Uh, they, could, they, uh, they served out a year, and then once that year was over, uh, they had to be rechosen. Uh, this, the, the process by which we were going to choose these delegates 
wasn't necessarily by a popular vote. They were chosen by their colonial legislatures, whatever the process was that the colonial legislatures felt was good for, for this, they could do that. Um, their, limits were, their terms were also limited uh, to no more than three terms in a six-year period. Um, they could have unlimited terms, but they had to take breaks every so often. Uh, what you're going to find uh, during this time period is if you didn't end up serving in the legislature, you ended up having some other important office as well, a uh, diplomat or some kind of cabinet uh, member. So, you know, don't cry for, for the, uh, the, the, the congressman who didn't get reelected or reappointed, as the case may be. There was also going to be a president of this Congress, and he was going to serve a single, a one-year term. Um, as far as passing laws, laws could be passed by a majority vote unless it was a really, really important one. And of course, as you can probably imagine, all of the decisions uh, were really, really important to somebody. Uh, and in the, in the case of important uh, decisions, decisions that impacted all of the states, um, there had to be a nine, uh, nine, a majority of nine votes rather than a simple majority. So about two-thirds of, the, uh, of the, um, the body would have to vote in order to approve of a particular law. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem, right? Mm. Anyway, um, now this of course brings uh, to mind the, the question of, uh, well, we have this president of the, uh, of the, uh, under the Articles of Confederation, the very first president being, of course, this handsome devil here, John Hansen. So was John Hansen, in fact, the first president of the United States? Um, yeah, I don't think so. Um, I think the argument can be made, but not particularly well. Um, first of all, this is the United States as we know the United States isn't the United States under the Articles of Confederation. It is the United States under the Constitution of these United States. Um, Secondly, John Hansen, as the president of the Congress under the Constitution, he was not the president in the way that we know of presidents as being an executive officer in charge of enforcement of the laws. Uh, in fact, he was just the presiding officer in the legislative body, which basically means uh, his job was to make sure that the meeting stayed on track. Uh, you know, so uh, he had very, very limited power, very, very little say over policy. Uh, he was mostly in charge of making sure that everybody got a chance to speak uh, in these meetings. So, President of the United States, John Hansen, yeah, nah. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's move on here. Now, one of the points of this uh, of this exercise in. Um, um, in, um, in government is we want to clearly delineate. We do not want to have a situation where we have absolute rule of a, even a governing body or a Congress or a legislative body. We don't want the government to be too oppressive. So what we're going to do is we're clearly going to delineate the powers of the government and we are going to clearly delineate the limits of that government. So what are these powers? Well, uh, for the most part, the Congress was going to have the power to deal with foreign governments. Um, but that did not necessarily preclude the states from dealing with, uh, with foreign governments, which is going to be a problem. Uh, but either way, when it came to negotiating treaties and things along those uh, trade agreements and stuff like that, the, uh, the Congress would be able to do that. Um, the Congress would be in charge of uh, maintaining the armed forces, making sure that the armed forces had enough money and enough equipment, enough weapons. Of course, this was taking place during the American Revolution. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that this Congress, this central body, had the power to call up these armed forces if they needed them. Uh, that was still retained by the states. Um, they could handle national finances, but could not necessarily tax the citizens directly in order to, uh, to build those national finances. They pretty much had to budget whatever it is that they had. Um, they were there to, uh, to kind of arbitrate state disputes, but didn't necessarily have the power to make decisions over which state was right and which state was wrong. Uh, they were able to set up a postal system, which of course they at first handed back over to uh, the brilliant uh, post and uh, America's first postmaster general, Benjamin Franklin. And 
the uh, Congress was also uh, given the exciting job of establishing these standardized weights and measures. <sighs> That's excitement. Anyway, um, but there were also limits uh, uh, on these powers, which we kind of talked about uh, just a second ago. Uh, the, uh, the Congress did not have the power to tax citizens directly. Only the states, only the colonial legislatures uh, could tax the citizens. Now, the government could say, hey, we need this much money, and we need the states to provide this, but it was going to be up to the states to figure out how they were going to provide it. And, of course, sometimes this is going to create some tensions, especially among big states and wealthy states, as opposed to small states who are paying maybe a little less. Um, anything that was not in the original Articles of Confederation that pertained to the, uh, this, this central governing body, the Congress, uh, deferred to the states. And also, they, in order to amend the Articles of Confederation, there had to be unanimous consent, a unanimous vote, all 13 uh, legislators had to approve this. So this was the way that we're going to use to, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to limit the powers of this particular government. Uh, here over on the board you see an interesting little innovation. Of course this is a banknote, and this is a banknote that is, bank, uh, um, that is, um, that is backed uh, by the uh, by the Confederate, not the Confederates, but the Articles of Confederation by the Congress. Uh, this is a $3 banknote. This bill entitles the bearer to receive three Spanish milled dollars. Oh, I can't write on this. Um, or the value thereof in gold and silver, according to a resolution of Congress uh, in Philadelphia, uh, February 1776. Actually, this, this actually came a little bit before then, so uh, February 1776 uh, isn't, in fact, the Articles of Confederation. Apparently, you have to be really careful about uh, about your. Let's see here. Get rid of this. About the sources that you put up before you put them up, Mr. Andosha. Uh, anyway, um, but this was typical a typical banknote that would have been put out by the uh, by the Congress. Um, and of course, these banknotes uh, are going to be kind of iffy. Uh, remember, we're going to bank it with Spanish gold. Um, well, all right. <laughs> so so anyway. Some accomplishments. Now, this uh, this governing body was not um, was not without its own accomplishments. Uh, the uh, this this economy this um, this Congress is going to be in charge of financing the war, finding ways to do this. Uh, Robert Morris, uh, for instance, is going to realize, hey, wait a minute, we've got a problem. We've got this huge debt. Um, the American Revolution is going to be funded by foreign loans, foreign investments. And uh, ultimately, the French and, in fact, the Spanish, who were also financing this, this war, were ultimately going to want their money. So the country has a tremendous amount of debt, uh, especially to foreign countries, but also to people within the country who are uh, trying to fund this, uh, this, uh, this revolution as well, as well as people who fell into debt because of the revolution. Um, and one of the ways that we dealt with this de debt was to print uh, money like <coughs> the Continental that <coughs> you saw misapplied just a, a minute ago. Um, well, it was really easy to print those things out, but it wasn't necessarily easy to back them with gold or silver. Um, so, uh, so for a while there, these, uh, this, this, uh, these, uh, these U.S. these uh, colonial notes, or what were called Continental notes. Uh, or continentals were literally worth the paper that they were printed on. The term "not worth continental" became a synonym for worthless. Uh, Robert Morris says, "Hey, you know what? I'm a really rich guy. I'm a very wealthy guy. One of the wealthiest men in the colonies." He says, "Look, I am going to fund a Bank of North America, and this is going to be our first experiment with a national bank um, for the purposes of funding this revolution." And Robert Morris is going to fund this revolution with largely his own capital. Uh, he is also going to get a bunch of his very wealthy friends to join in and chip in a little bit. And, uh, yeah, they're chipping in gold and they're chipping in silver. They're also chipping in, like, family heirlooms and silverware and, you know, old lamps and stuff like that. It was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting bank. Probably the most important and most pressing uh, accomplishment uh, to take place under the Articles of Confederation is the negotiation of peace with Britain. Uh, this was done... Uh, by these uh, these gentlemen here, of course we have um, our buddy uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, we have John Adams, and this handsome devil here is John Jay. And they will go to Paris, and their goal is going to be to negotiate independence 
uh, with the British. And, um, of course, their primary goals are, uh, yeah, whoops, the, I don't know if you can see that's one through four. Um, primary goals is one, uh, Britain is going to have to recognize that the, the American, what used to be the American colonies are now its own country. They have to recognize in, American independence. Um, and in doing that, they're also going to have to remove their soldiers from these independent American colonies. You can't just have your soldiers in a sovereign, you know, somebody else's sovereign state. Um, the uh, colonists were also kind of weary, especially up in New England area, were saying, oh, wait a minute. Uh, right now, we have free reign to, uh, to sail around in the North Atlantic and fish and whale. Um, we want to secure those rights. We want to make sure that the British are not going to harass us in the Atlantic, um, you know, in this case. And so this became another target, uh, another goal. Uh, fishing rights in the North Atlantic. Who'd have thunk uh, that, uh, that issues with regard to the American Revolution would revolve around fishing rights? And also, their goal was to expand their territory as much as was possible. And by as much as possible, uh, what the Founding Fathers meant when they shipped these guys off to Paris is, we want it all. We want all of the British territory. Remember that um, Royal Proclamation line of uh, 1763 was still kind of ticking the colonists off, or the, uh, the, now the American continentals off. Um, so they want all that land, all the way up to the Mississippi. And, of course, they want Canada. Canada, Ugh, we got to get it, we got to have it, we love it, we got to get our Canada. So they want it all. Um, well, of course, uh, what's the outcome of this going to be? Uh, you know, John Jay and uh, Benjamin Franklin and, uh, and uh, John Adams are going to negotiate a treaty. Uh, and in fact, uh, France is going to kind of mandate that, the, that they, since this is taking place in Paris, uh, and the French are the biggest, uh, you know, backers of the American Revolution. They want to have a hand in negotiating uh, the, the peace treaty. Uh, but what, what uh, Franklin and Adams and Jay end up doing is you know, they kind of went behind the French backs and negotiated when the French weren't looking. You know, it kind of ticked the French off a little bit with one of the first uh, national, uh, international incidents that we had with an ally. Um, and, of course, in any negotiation... There's a give and take. There are certain things that the American co that the American continentals are going to get, and certain things they're simply not going to get. And it's a testament to one just how effectively uh, George Washington led the military resistance to, uh, you know, to the British, uh, and um, and that the victory at Yorktown and how important that was uh, for American history. Also, British resistance to the war in the streets. Um, was becoming very, very pressing, was also very important. And the skill of men like, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay in negotiating and kind of doing a little kind of a sneaky, underhanded job of doing that. Um, some of the concessions that the British made, well, yep, you can have uh, independence. Independence recognized. Check. Got it. Um, we're gonna, we promise as soon as you guys pay off your debts... Eh, we'll take the soldiers out of, out of the American colonies. Well, all right, I promise to get the uh, soldiers out of the colonies. Check, we'll, we'll check that one off. Got it. And guess what? You want to fish in the North Atlantic? Fish away. Go fish. Fish all you want. We can fish and whale and do what you need to do in the North Atlantic. We won't bother you. Check, another one. Hey, we're doing pretty good. All right, well, what about the, uh, the territorial expansion? Well, all right, wait a minute. Um... So the British had already decided, uh, you know what, the Americans, you guys can have everything west of the Appalachian Mountains up to the Mississippi River. The British didn't care. That was all Indian territory anyway. We would be more than happy to give away somebody else's land. Um, what you can't have is Canada. No Canada. We love our Canada. We're keeping our Canada. No Canada for you. All right, so we didn't get Canada. Ah, uh, Canada. All right. But, of course, there are certain things that the American colonists are going to have to... Uh, you know, going to have to concede to as well. So uh, among those concessions is, well, the first of those concessions is, you know, Canada. <laughs> we don't get it. We're not going to have it. Uh, and we're never going to get it. Uh, we're going to try again later on. We'll talk about that in another lecture. But we're not going to get Canada, clearly. Um, the Americans had to promise to pay their debts. Uh, there were plenty of war debts, and the, American, uh, the Americans had to promise to, to pay them up completely. Um, and um, also the British really wanted the Americans to repay 
the loyalists in the colonists who had been driven from their homes and had been driven from their lands, um, and also those loyalists who had not yet fled their homes or not yet fled their lands, the British wanted to make sure that they weren't going to be forced to, that there weren't going to be any recriminations against those people who decided to remain uh, loyal to the English. And the Americans gave this up. They said, all right, well, we'll, we'll take care of that. And um, ultimately, another uh, concession is you've got to understand Spain was also involved in this war. Spain had sided with the colonies. And in the process of doing so, the Spanish kind of wanted, you know, some of the, some of the pie. Uh, they wanted some of that land west of the Mississippi River. And, um, and um, the, uh, the Americans are going to say, ah, uh, no, you know what, you could have Florida back, because, you know, Florida. Uh, so uh, the Spanish are going to get Florida back. Oh, and finally, one more thing. Um, the British, who are still going to have colonies in... Uh, in Canada and along the Great Lakes, I'm going to want to use the Mississippi River. So the British are going to negotiate to still be allowed to use and openly uh, sail along the Mississippi River. So good stuff there. Um, looked pretty good. Uh, and of course, when the French heard about this particular treaty, by the way, uh, they were like, uh, uh, Mondu, uh, you can't negotiate a treaty without us. And Franklin and uh, Adams and Jay pretty much went, well, we just did. And if you don't agree to it, well, we might have to open into an alliance with Britain against you. And the French are like, ah, oh, you little, oh, all right, well, we'll just accept it and we'll just get on with things the way it is, you, you little American somethings. Anyway, um, but uh, there's still going to be conflicts that are going to have to be resolved. And uh, one of the most pressing conflicts and one of the most, uh, I think, one probably one of the most dramatic moments in American history, probably a a little talked about moment, but probably one of the most important moments in American history happened uh, during this time period. It had to do with the officers. Now, these officers of the American Revolution were still in the field. Um, the Battle of Yorktown was in 1781. The Treaty of Paris wasn't until 1783. So for two years, these soldiers sat in the field and waited for word. Are they going to have to fight again, or is there going to be peace? Uh, they, they remained in the field, and they were getting a little bit antsy. Uh, the Congress had made an agreement with them and said, hey, look, if you guys remain at your posts until the end of the war, we will give you a pension equal to half of your salaries uh, for the rest of your life. And many of them took them up on that. But then as, the, as things are going to start to get a little shaky economically, and we're seeing that the continental currency wasn't really worth all that much, many of the, uh, the officers said, well, you know what? This whole pension thing, just let's face it, isn't going to happen. We want our money now. Give it to us instead of in a pension. Give it to us in one big, you know, check, basically, uh, uh, of a bonus. Uh, get the money now, and we'll, we'll do what we want with it. Um, and Congress is like, ah, I don't really think we have the money to do that right now. You're going to have to hold off. We'll, we'll give you the pension. Well, the officers all got angry and disgruntled about that, and under the leadership of, of General Horatio, uh, Horatio Gates, remember him from, uh, you know, from uh, the, the battles in the North and the, uh, and the American Revolution, under the leadership of Horatio Gates, the, the generals say, hey, you know what, this isn't cool. And Horatio Gates says, you know what we need to do? We need to just march on Congress. And we will take over the Congress, and we will run the country, and we will do a better job of it because we are generals, and generals are just better at things like that. Um, and, but before they could do that, before they could do that, they had to touch base with uh, their buddy George Washington. And this, this is probably one of the most dramatic moments uh, of the revolution, of, the, of this particular period. It was absolutely huge. Because at this moment, by, by the way, this was, this was called the Newburgh Conspiracy. And that is going to disappear. So you better write that down, because I didn't turn off the magic pens. Let's look, it's, uh, it's already disappearing. Anyway, it was called the Newburgh Conspiracy. And uh, George Washington walks in. Okay, they, they gather in this, in this room. Uh, they're, they're deciding they're going to they're gonna march. But you've got to have George Washington on your side. George Washington, of course, walks in. Um, you know, he's a, this, this very tall man, over six feet tall, the tallest man in the room, imposing figure, walks up to the, uh, to the front of the room. Uh, pulls out a speech that he had prepared, 
And in pulling out the speech, he also removes a pair of spectacles. And he looks up at his, uh, at his uh, you know, compatriots, people who had served with him for so many years, and he says, gentlemen, you must excuse me. Uh, I have grown gray in your service, and now I find myself growing blind. And he puts his glasses on to read his speech. And the speech was just a, a, an attack against the old concept of these soldiers who had served faithfully uh, the cause of the American Revolution. Um, now going to take, uh, you know, take down the government of their brand new republic. How can you do this? And of course he had some very, very harsh words for Horatio Gates. Um, ripping into him and just ridiculing him. And then he was done with the speech. And without saying another word, he leaves the room. And that was the end of the Newburgh Conspiracy. It could have gone a different way. Had it been a lesser man than George Washington, uh, we could have been living under a dictatorship at that point. Uh, they had the power to do it. Um, so you can kind of see uh, there's some conflicts that need to be resolved. We also have to figure out we're getting all this big chunk of territory. Uh, what are we going to do with it? Um, and uh, we've talked about some of, the, uh, some of the territorial problems that we had before. Uh, Kentucky, by the way, had, uh, had kind of broken out from uh, what was uh, uh, Virginia, and they were having some, some issues of surveying the land, and they were double surveying. It was a bad deal all around. So what the Constitution, what the, uh, the, con the Congress decided to do is they actually, some of their more important uh, decisions here, um, they put into effect in 1785 what became known as the Land Ordinance. And the Land Ordinance uh, provided for surveying the lands and also provided for, um, it, uh, provided for auctioning those lands off. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had suggested, hey, why don't we just give these lands away for free? And the Congress went, for, for what? No, 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 we're not going to give it away for free. Uh, have you seen our bank account? We can't give anything away for free. But we can charge a dollar, a dollar per acre, and uh, you can go in there and you can buy your land. And this was a great opportunity for, for landowners to go into this territory that they've been wanting this territory for what? Over 20 years, they've been trying to get in there. Well, let's face it, some of them have already been in there. Um, but either way, the land ordinance was a very, very important provision. We're going to go over some of the details of that in just a second. And then finally, the Northwest Ordinance. Now, the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 said, all right, we've got this land, we're surveying this land. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to dispose of it? What about Native Americans on the land? Uh, well, they're going to have to give some of that up because they sided against us uh, during the American Revolution. Well, what about those Indians who didn't side, who didn't side against you in the American Revolution. Well, we'll make them give up their land too. Um, so anyway, um, so the Northwest Ordinance said, okay, we're going to divide these lands up into territories. We're going to have the Wisconsin Territory, the Illinois Territory, Indiana Territory, Ohio Territory, uh, Michi uh, you know, Michigan Territory. Uh, so we're going we're to divide this, uh, th these territories up. And most importantly, we're not going to use these, t these territories as just an extension of, our co of colonial rule and create an empire. No, we're going to provide a means by which uh, these territories are going to be able to come into the country as states. And this is going to be a centerpiece of American expansion for the whole of the 19th century, bringing these states in, even into the early 20th century. Um, and most interestingly, slavery. Slavery is going to be prohibited in this Northwest Territory, these territories uh, north of the Ohio River, up to the Missouri. Um, wow, we're going to outlaw slavery. And this gives you an idea of, wait a minute, there's, there's definitely a uh, discussion going on about how to deal with slavery in this new country. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, we also start seeing during this time uh, some political divisions that are starting to happen. Of course, uh, the loyalists are done politically. They, they have no say in American political affairs at all. But that doesn't mean that everybody's pretty much in agreement. Um, there were those who were, took up what we would call the Whig position. Uh, and the Whigs were largely for a stronger centralized government, saying, hey, look, we've got to be able to take care of ourselves. We, there are certain things that we've got we to be able to do. Let's set up a system very much like they have in England, except we won't have a king. Instead of a king, we will have a governor who is elected or selected through a Republican process. 
Um, we will have an upper house, an upper chamber for landowners or major landowners, and then we can have like a lower house for for minor landowners and property owners. Um, and then we can we can kind of run things very much like the prime minister and the parliament do in England, and things should work out pretty well that way. Uh, and then you had folks who were a little bit more radical. These were your Democrats, um, small, you know, and. Um, and these guys are going to say, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're, we just fought a war over freedom and uh, rights and liberty and stuff like that. What do you mean create property owner, uh, you know, higher order? And, and, and creating a government based on Britain, don't we just beat Britain? No, we don't want that. We want democratic rule. We want all people in the country to be able to have a say. Um, let's make all of our choices democratically. Let's elect everybody, legislators, judges, uh, you know, postmen or whatever. Of course, some Democrats were more Democratic than others. A few Democrats were saying, hey, let's let black people vote. Hey, let's let women vote. Hey, let's let Native Americans vote. Um, but they, the Democrat was saying, hey, let's let everybody vote regardless of property distinctions. Let, let, let's let everybody vote regardless of religion. And these are some, some huge, um, you know, huge characteristics. We also start seeing that many of these states are going to have to negotiate their own their own uh, constitutions, and we start to see some interesting variations of the theme. Of course, there were some states where the Democrats were more powerful. There were, especially out in the uh, the frontier regions, where there was a little bit more of a, a rugged individualism. And uh, there were some states that had more of a Whig influence, especially your more um, your more you know established col uh, former colonies. So. Um, so but what we start seeing is people are starting to demand, hey, look, if we're going to have a government, we need to have a government that recognizes that we have certain rights that can't be taken away. And what better way to recognize that in, in, other than to write it down and actually put it into your state constitution. So we start to see the development of, a, of bills of rights. These are specifically uh, delineated rights that are reserved by the people that the government cannot trespass against, ideally. Um, this, uh, one of the first is, of course, the, uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, written by George Mason, uh, mostly, and passed into the, uh, the Virginia Constitution. Uh, Virginia is going to be a, um, a kind of a gateway for, for, uh, for this idea, especially, for instance, um, we have Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom. The end of religious tests for serving in office, for holding, uh, for being allowed to vote, the the ability to believe however you want to believe or not, pardon me, not believe, um, without having your rights trespass, trespassed against. Um, an example, of course, is in your notes. This uh, this section here, and if you take a look at this, this is um, two sections of the Virginia Bill of Rights, and they look kind of familiar. Uh, later. Uh, maybe about 10 years later, we will have, you know, something similarly set up in a, a, our second attempt at a government, which is going to work a little bit better. Um, what about women? Women during this time had had an active role in the American Revolution, and they're saying, well, wait a minute, you can't just forget about the, the ladies. Um, you know, we want some recognition, and they're not necessarily going to get it legally uh, or formally, but informally, women are going to start to have a little bit more freedom. Um, they're uh, they're going to get their way more often in court. They're going to be uh, you know heard, especially with regard to property rights, especially for widows of the American Re uh, of the American Revolution, women who are holding down the the property and the farms and the uh, the businesses that their husbands were now unable to do because eh, they were dead. So, uh, so women are, are going to start getting a little bit more recognition, not quite nearly enough. Uh, we can't say they're going to actually get rights at this stage of the game, but certainly a lot more recognition. And also the slavery question was, was a problem. A lot of these foreign, uh, foreign governments, uh, especially France and, Eng and especially England, that had already, uh, you know, they're saying, hey, how can you claim to be for freedom and liberty and equality and still hold slaves? And uh, some of our founding fathers were like, hmm, yeah, you kind of got a point there. You got us a bit. We're going to have to deal with this issue. Now, further north, where there was less of, uh, of a dependence on uh, slavery, many of these northern states said, you know what, they're right. Let's just end slavery. Um, and they went about the process of ending slavery. Some of, some of them were, you know, more deliberate than others. Uh, but for the most part, in most of the southern states, by the end of the American Revolution, slavery was 
uh, was outlawed. Uh, especially in those states that said, hey, look, if you serve in the American uh, military, you can have your freedom. Well, an awful lot of folks signed on for that idea. Um, further down in the south, where the slave population was larger and uh, the economy was, was more dependent upon slave labor, they were not likely to give up their slaves. But we do start to see this movement afoot, and we start to see that there are regional differences. The closer you get to the northern climes, the less likely you were to be, um, you know, to be in favor of slavery. Even some of our founding fathers, our slaveholding fa founding fathers, had to negotiate this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, well, oftentimes was writing laws into effect to end or to, you know, kind of get rid of slavery, only to have them slashed out, uh, you know, by other people. Um, and even George Washington was, took part in a movement in which um, he wrote into his will that upon his death, his slaves would be freed. Um, you know, and this was actually a growing movement. He was not the only person to do this. So the slavery question is starting to come into effect. And, of course, the slavery question is not going to be answered until huh, 1865, uh, you know, m almost, uh, you know, 80 years later. Um, this, of course, is the, uh, a map showing uh, the provisions of the Northwest Ordinance and the Land Ordinance. You can take a look at this uh, on your own. Uh, but I will, t I will point out this section here. Um, if you take a look at section 16, um, section 16 of all of these uh, surveyed territories, any money that was made from section 16 was money that was specifically delineated for schools and for education and for founding uh, you know, colleges and things along those lines. So that's a very interesting innovation that took place as a, as a result of this, uh, of this land ordinance. So, um, and we also see this Northwest Territory, which, of course, again, no slavery. Now, the Articles of Confederation just did not provide a, a particularly strong enough government. I'm going to race through this relatively quickly because I, I can see I'm already at like 36 minutes and that's, that's tough. I hope you've stopped and gotten a sandwich or something like that. Um, but anyway, the big issue here... Ladies and gentlemen, the economy, ah, ah, economics. Why are you such a problem for us all the dang time? Um, they st the problem is, is we don't have an established currency at this stage of the game. Um, and it's very difficult for a brand new country to establish currency because who's going to invest in that currency? This country may be gone next year. We're not going to invest in your currency. So uh, getting gold and keeping your hand on gold was, was very important, but it was also very difficult to do since your currency was deflated um, and you were trading goods, Britain, uh, namely with Britain, interestingly enough, we're trading our goods with Britain and Britain is demanding uh, payment in gold. And many of our industries and many of our, uh, you know, the, the, the resources that we ship to Britain were underdeveloped as a result of the American Revolution, whereas the British uh, merchandise was up and running. So they're dumping their merchandise into the United States, uh, creating a huge trade deficit, which means that, they were sh that we were importing more from Britain than we were exporting to Britain, uh, and that creates what's called a trade deficit. And Britain was demanding that this trade deficit be paid for in gold or silver, stuff that had value. They didn't want our paper currency. Also, uh, what's going to happen as a result of this is the banks. The banks are lo losing gold. They're losing valuable uh, resources. So what they're going to want to do is, hey, if you own land and you own property and there's a mortgage, we hold a mortgage on your property, boom, we're going to take that land. We want, our we want that land. We want that, that something of actual real value. So the banks start calling in on their mortgages. Among the people that they started calling in on their mortgages were, of course, people who got mortgages because they couldn't develop their land because they were doing something like, oh, I don't know, fight for liberty and freedom during the American Revolution. The banks didn't care about all the liberty and freedom nonsense. They want their money. So, uh, yeah, great. Thanks for being out in Valley Forge. Thanks for that whole Yorktown thing. But can you pay for your farm? No, we're taking it. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, you can imagine that some of, these, some of these soldiers who fought in the American Revolution and were now losing their farms because of it 
were a little nonplussed. Um, and, you know, ironically, another consequence of this economy was that the government was kind of forced to raise taxes. And in fact, taxes went up higher than they were before the American Revolution. And you can imagine that probably uh, rubbed some people the wrong way as well. Well, ultimately what is going to happen is a group of these folks who are... Um, a group of these folks who are seeing their farms being yanked out from under them uh, are going to rebel. Uh, in fact, a whole bunch of them are, but the most significant of them was a fellow by the name of Captain Daniel Shays in what will become... Ooh, oh, it's not doing the thingy-majiggy thingy. All right, uh, Captain Daniel Shays. Uh, and Captain Daniel Shays is going to... Um, to start a rebellion, he's going to get all of his former militia friends together, his military friends together, and he, he's going to, um, you know, shut down the courts to make sure that um, that the um, that they can't sell their mortgages, sell their farms at auction, um, and they're going to ultimately march on Springfield. Uh, these guys, uh, there was another one, uh, a, a revolution by a fellow, fellow by the name of Luke Day, I believe he was out in Pennsylvania. Um, they were up, rising up, and um, and what do we do? Uh, how do we deal with this? And the problem was, is that the national government, the, under the Articles of Confederation, had no power to deal with this. Um, and now you have, so you have uh, Daniel Shays in Massachusetts raising havoc. Well, call up the militia. We can't. Well, why not? Well, because the militia are with Captain Shays. He's in control of them. We don't have a militia. Um, all right, so now we're in trouble. So all the merchants in Massachusetts get together, start pooling their money, and they raise their own little private army to go after Shays, and ultimately they will be uh, successful. Uh, ironically, the man who actually got the sword uh, from Cornwallis during Cornwallis' surrender, Benjamin Lincoln, was the guy who led the, uh, the attack against Shays in, uh, in Springfield that, that ended with the defeat of, uh, of Shays. Um, and many of your most ardent patriots, of course, were the ones demanding that Shays be hanged. People like uh, Samuel Adams suggested, hey, you know, we can't, you can't let these treasonous people, you know, just rebel against their government and get away, what? Get away, get away with it, huh? It Sam Adams, you're, you're the one saying that, right? Wow, that's awesome. Um, so uh, then there were guys like Thomas Jefferson who said, eh, a little revolution here never hurt anybody. Um, but either way, it showed some serious, serious weaknesses in the, in the uh, Articles of Confederation that, um, that, they, that needed to be dealt with. Among these, uh, among these uh, weaknesses is um, there was just no central authority. There was no way for the, uh, for the government under the Articles of Confederation to enforce any of the laws that it actually even came up with. They did not have enforcement authority. All the enforcement was in the hands of the states, for obvious reasons. The states did not want to be burdened by a too powerful central government. Um, they had no power. The, uh, the Congress had no power to tax. They could ask the states for money, and the monies, and they, the states themselves could could raise the taxes and raise the funds. Eh, but then again, there was no real enforcement mechanism to make that happen. <coughs> and any laws that were needed were very difficult to pass. You needed to have a nine vote, you know, a nine vote majority. Uh, that was very difficult to raise. You had very serious regional differences. Northeaster, uh, Northeasterners had very different uh, opinions about things than your mid, your Midwest, uh, your mid-Atlantic states, who had a, a somewhat different way of looking at things than your uh, than your uh, southern states. And you have these western states that are going to come in with their own interests and their own ideas. It was very very difficult uh, to get laws actually passed and. Um, you, it was virtually impossible to amend the Articles of Confederation in order to improve it and to get, the, get a little bit more power to the government. Um, and finally, um, the, there was no real court system. There was no national court system to help resolve conflicts that arose between states. Uh, so why should, say, Virginia send a militia to Massachusetts to help the Massachusettsians with their problems? They shouldn't. Eh, deal with your own problems. We've got our own things going on here. So the Articles of Confederation were just not, despite the 
despite the accomplishments of the uh, Articles of Confederation, uh, the Articles of Confederation were simply not good enough uh, to create a stable and reliable government, and the Articles had to go. In the next class, we will talk about uh, our second attempt at creating a, a government, and maybe get into some of the uh, the, di the early diplomacy of the American uh, uh, of early American time. So, uh, talk to you then.